Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, present the next uh, speaker, who is Eric Rosenthal, um, who is a consultant uh, pediatric cardiologist in uh, Evelina Children's Hospital, um, one of the most experienced uh, people in electrophysiology and interventional cardiology. And uh, he is going to talk to us about um, arrhythmia management uh, during pregnancy. Am I live? Yes, you are. Okay. Thank, thank you, John and Michael and Aphrodite for the invitation. Uh, it reminds me, it's sad that we're not in Greece, but the last time I was here, I saw Alexander, and it tells me that none of you should get to be too famous, because if you do get to be too famous, you're going to have bird droppings on your head for the rest of time. So just be careful in that regard. Um, when we come to arrhythmias in pregnancy, sinus tachycardia is probably the commonest issue, although it's not pathological. The normal pre-pregnancy heart rate between 60 to 100 usually averages 80, but in pregnancy there's a 20 to 25% increase in the sinus rate. While cardiac output and vascular resistance changes have occurred by the second trimester, heart rate continues to increase from first to second to third trimester and mimics the increase in plasma volume. If you do get an excess of sinus tachycardia, you need to exclude anemia, thyrotoxicosis, and cardiomyopathy of pregnancy. But uh, on occasion, when all of that's excluded, you have women who have fast heartbeats, feel uncomfortable, and they have a, you know, inappropriate sinus tachycardia that does resolve after pregnancy, but may well need beta blockers during pregnancy. Ectopic beats. Atrial and ventricular ectopics are common, increasing frequency during pregnancy, although it may appear for the first time. They often cause huge anxiety, and it's important to be strongly reassuring, and that's very rare that medication is required. Supraventricular tachycardia, known about, may increase in frequency during pregnancy, but also may appear for the first time. All the common medications are effective in pregnancy, although we need to be careful that they are appropriate for pregnancy. Catheter ablation really should be done before pregnancy to avoid the need for medication and to avoid uh, tachycardias that could upset the, the mother as well as the fetus. During pregnancy, they can be performed under local anesthetic with minimum sedation and without fluoroscopy. And if uh, a transesophageal echocardiogram is needed, then it can be done under general anesthetic. So this is how we would do catheter ablation currently. Here's a map, the SVC, IVC, right atrium, tricuspid valve. You can see on the right here, the needle attached to the imaging system is brought from the SVC. It is placed in the fossa valus and then punctures across into the, uh, is it still running? Uh, and then it punctures across into the left atrium. I'm not sure where this video gets across there. It is It is running slowly. It's running slowly. Okay. Um, it should go across. Uh, the good thing is to puncture slowly and not do anything aggressive, but I'm sorry. Okay, I'll move on. Um, atrial fibrillation is uncommon in pregnancy, but when it occurs, you need to consider congenital heart disease, in particular mitral stenosis, hypothyroidism. You can terminate this with intravenous flaconide. Cardioversion is safe in pregnancy, it can be done at any time, but if fibrillation has existed for a long time, you need to consider anticoagulation or transesophageal guided uh, cardioversion. Medical control with the usual medications is effective and catheter ablation is very rarely needed. Um, the one time that atrial fibrillation is dangerous is with Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. Yeah, you have the beginning of atrial fibrillation degenerating into ventricular fibrillation, requiring resuscitation, and in sinus rhythm, you now see the delta wave. And this sort of patient should undergo catheter ablation during pregnancy. Um, ventricular tachycardia, in particular, the monomorphic right ventricular outflow tract and fascicular VTs are benign in general. They may 
behave very similar to SVT. They may increase in frequency and may appear for the first time. And the usual medications are very effective. Again, as with SVT, catheter ablation should be considered before pregnancy if you know about the arrhythmia. But if you have to do it during pregnancy, it can be done under local anesthetic with minimal sedation without fluoroscopy. Uh, polymorphic VT and ventricular fibrillation, clearly a much more serious condition, often associated with underlying cardiac conditions, congenital or myopathic, underlying channelopathies, cardiomyopathy of pregnancy, and even spontaneous coronary artery dissection, and then primary ventricular fibrillation. Obviously, a patient with this kind of arrhythmia needs prompt resuscitation and defibrillation, and you would then need to put in prophylactic medication and an ICD. Um, moving on to antiarrhythmic medication, you know that adenosine is safe during pregnancy to terminate SVTs and for diagnostic purposes. Pregnant women oftentimes respond to lower doses than pre-pregnancy. Amiodarone can be used, but preferably only short term as it has thyroid and IUGR effects on the fetus. Beta blockers in general are safe, although a tenolol in particular should be avoided in the first trimester, again, giving IUGR. Digoxin is very safe and maternal doses need to be higher than in the pre-pregnancy state. Flaconide and Sotolol are also safe, and verapamil can be used intravenously, but if it's given too rapidly, there's maternal hypotension, which could affect the fetus. Digoxin, Flaconide, and Sotolol are used for the treatment of fetal arrhythmias and are given often in high doses to the mothers, but when the mother needs them, they are therefore perfectly safe to use. It is important with flaconide and sotolol to monitor the ECG and look for changes in QRS and QT intervals. And beta blockers, again, also used in the fetus less commonly. What about the long QT syndrome? Um, here, beta blockers are the mainstay of treatment. Some patients may have had a sympathectomy or have an ICD. And the main important thing is to continue beta blockers and to avoid any drugs on the long QT drugs to avoid list. And that's important. Pregnancy is usually uncomplicated, but there are two features in pregnancy related to the long QT syndrome. The peak in incidence of events is in the postpartum period, particularly in long QT2. And the other thing is that if a fetal sinus bradycardia is detected, this may be the first clue that the mother herself has the long QT syndrome. And if a fetal bradycardia is detected, it's important to do an ECG on the mother. Brugada syndrome oftentimes raises great concerns amongst obstetricians and uh, anesthetists. Here you see the typical uh, ST elevation pattern. The mainstay of treatment is not drug related. You treat fevers early and energetically, and that's important in post-delivery fevers, and you need to avoid dehydration. Also, you need to avoid medications on the drugs to avoid list. This can cause some confusion. Propofol and bupivacaine are on that list, yet uh, my anesthetist always uses propofol for introduction when we're putting in an ICD in a Brugada patient. And bupivacaine can probably be given intrathecally rather than uh, any other route as long as it's a small dose. Uh, there's been one study which is quite helpful from Belgium. In 104 women with Brugada syndrome, more than two babies per patient, three with ICDs and four with aborted sudden death, and none of them had events during pregnancy. Equally, patients with syncope before pregnancy had a similar uh, incidence of syncopal events during pregnancy. So it does seem that Brugada doesn't impose too much on pregnancy. Catalchemonergic polymorphic VT, beta blockers, again, are the mainstay of treatment. Some patients will also be on flaconide and had a sympathectomy or an ICD. Again, pregnancy is usually uncomplicated, but intrapartum stress may trigger the bidirectional VT and ventricular fibrillation. And really good sedation and analgesia are important here. If necessary, intravenous esmolol can be used for arrhythmias. What about congenital complete heart block? 
by the time you get to being pregnant and have not required a pacemaker, most of these patients are clearly asymptomatic. They can raise their heart rate under stress and they tolerate pregnancy well. If necessary, during operative intervention, the heart rate can be increased with isoprenolin. And pacemaker implantation is rarely needed during pregnancy. In some patients with a fixed heart rate who start to develop uh, cardiac impairment towards the end of the second or third trimester, and occasional patients with syncope, you might consider a pacemaker. Um, this is a patient of mine, an asymptomatic 28-year-old woman. You can see her heart rate at rest is slow in the 40s to 50s, but on exercise, she gets up to 120 quite comfortably, and she tolerates pregnancy very well. Uh, pacemakers can also be put in without fluoroscopy. This is the non-fluoroscopy uh, imaging system, drawing a map of the I SVC, IVC, right atrium and right fin ventricle, and you can see the red is the atrial lead and the green is the ventricular lead, and these can be put in, they say, without any fluoroscopy, but in fact, there's a slight cheat that once the leads have been screwed in place, there's usually a, a few second uh, fluoroscopy while the lead is advanced to create enough of a loop so the leads don't displace during follow-up. Uh, you will find pacemakers and ICDs in pregnant women. Patients with congenital or post-operative complete heart block and pacemakers with normal ventricular function, there are no real concerns during pregnancy. If, however, they need diathermy for a cesarean section, it's important to note that some that pacemakers will be inhibited by the diathermy and therefore you need to involve your pacemaker physiologists or use very short bursts of diathermy not to inhibit the pacemaker. Similarly with ICDs, there are usually no concerns during pregnancy, but diathermy may trigger a ventricular fibrillation shock, and so you need to switch the ICD off. This can be done again using a, a magnet over the device, but better to get your physiologist in. In patients with unrepaired or palliated congenital heart disease and a pacemaker and ICD, here the prognosis and management depends very much on ventricular function and functional state, and this is the group of patients with the highest risk in pregnancy and you need comprehensive cardiac and obstetric uh, multidisciplinary input. This is a patient of mine. I hope the video plays. Uh, a 19-year-old woman, congenitally corrected transposition and heart block. She's had dual chamber pacing for 10 years. She comes up for generator end of life. You can see she's got a slightly dilated hypertrophied systemic right ventricle. Uh, it is dyskinetic and she's getting married. And um, so uh, she gets uh, a new intervention. We find the coronary sinus and can then place a lead in the coronary sinus, which allows her to be, have biventricular pacing. And this gives better synchrony and better cardiac function. Uh, this was done before pregnancy. She's now pregnant and hopefully due to deliver in the next few months. Um, again, the complexity of heart disease doesn't always predict the outcome. Here you see a lady with a Fontan operation, an old style Fontan where tricuspid atresia and the coronary sinus still attach to the right atrium and the ventricular lead is actually passed through the coronary sinus. Um, she's actually tolerated three pregnancies without any difficulties despite all that. So it really has to be individualized the management of patients with congenital heart disease, arrhythmias and devices. Um, we mentioned long QT syndrome and the postpartum uh, effect. This is a 26-year-old woman who in the postpartum period developed three syncopal events. She was not known to have long QT syndrome. And here you can see her QT interval is extremely prolonged, typical finding for long QT2. Uh, they planned to put in an ICD, but in fact, before they got round to it, she was pregnant again. Um, this is the subcutaneous ICD with ICDs entirely external to the chest. The lead is under the skin in a parasternal position, the generator in the side. And this is what an X-ray looks like. But in this lady, the SICD was placed without fluoroscopy and they did not use a shock induction 
although that probably would have been safe to test it. Um, in fact, seven weeks after delivery of the second child, she had a further syncopal event, and this showed that she'd gone into ventricular fibrillation and had been defibrillated appropriately. So in conclusion, pregnancy is usually possible and well tolerated in most patients with arrhythmia, inherited arrhythmia syndromes, pacemakers, and ICDs. Arrhythmias developing during pregnancy can be managed with standard treatment, but medication needs to be carefully selected. Pacemaker ICDs and ablation are rarely needed, but possible. In patients with heart disease and arrhythmias, or patients with complicated arrhythmias, the outcome depends on the functional status and combined obstetric and cardiac input is required. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, for a, a very a nice presentation. And uh, uh, you touched on all the uh, important aspects of uh, arrhythmias during pregnancy. I think the, the main message is if you can um, take care of some of the arrhythmia issues before pregnancy, uh, better do that, um, although it's possible to do all these procedures in, in pregnancy safely, but always nice to, to prevent than, than treat. Um, and um, can, you, can you hear me? Yes. I mean, I okay. think I agree that applies to all oh, okay. the yes. arrhythmias. It applies yes. to the structural lesions as well, as we've Thank heard, you. the Marfans, the structural lesions. If you can deal with them before pregnancy, it's far better. Yeah, I do have a question regarding uh, long QT uh, in postpartum period. How long do you, do you usually uh, observe patients in the hospital? Because as we know, some of the um, events may happen sometime later, uh, not in the immediate postpartum period. I, I guess that's a difficult question, John, because if the patient's known to have long QT, particularly long QT2, they're on a good dose of beta blocker and or they have a reveal device in place, I think you might let them out within a couple of within the normal time period because these events can happen six to 12 weeks later. You can't really keep a patient in hospital that long. Yes. So yes. I think the important thing is to start your prophylactic treatment and make sure that they do avoid any medications in the postpartum period, so particularly anti-emetic drugs and other things that cause a problem. John, I have a question as well. May I? Yes, very please. Clear. It's very clear. Yes, please. Short question for, uh, for Eric. Uh, excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Um, there is a well-known exacerbation of uh, supraventricular tachycardia during pregnancy and, and beyond. Um, what is the possible, the potential mechanism or mechanisms for this phenomenon? I mean, I, I guess you just blame it on the pregnancy, don't you? The changes in autonomic toes, hormones, all those things. I'm afraid we need a real basic scientist to tell us exactly what is the trigger. But just blame the pregnancy, much easier. And one question. So, yes, go ahead, please, Costas. Uh, thank you for the lecture. Uh, I would like to ask... If ablation is uh, practical during pregnancy? Uh, as absolutely. Um, you, you put the woman down, ideally with just sedation uh, and local anesthesia, making sure that she's positioned so there's no compression on the IVC. You can place all your catheters without fluoroscopy. Okay. And ablation is a very straightforward procedure, pregnant or not. Yes, we don't like to do it. We don't want to do it. But if you have to, then I think it's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. You just have to cross that threshold. And as we've said before, if you can deal with arrhythmia beforehand, but if it's a new arrhythmia that appears and if a woman has pre-excited atrial fibrillation and needs cardioversion during pregnancy, I think you've got no option but to go ahead and do an ablation. Even if you put on medication, I'd go for an ablation. So um, uh, I'm sure that we will have time to, to talk more about this issue during discussion. In the interest of time, I would like to uh, let uh, George uh, to present the next speaker. Thank you.